episode of Vice Pilots and WT. Look at the white flag in Venezuela. Mikey scours the planet to track down a long lost water bomber. I'll do what I can do. Kelly's health takes a turn for the worse. Might as well smoke. There you go. And a four legged passenger dumps a souvenir in flight. Dogs just sit everywhere. Out of your hats, boy. The Canadair CL215 water bomber. A 40-year-old amphibious plane that remains in high demand today. It's designed to skim over 5,000 kilograms of water off lakes in just 10 seconds and dump it over forest fires. The 215, also known as the Scooper, was sold worldwide but went out of production in 1990. It's a pretty rare aircraft. There's only about 125 of them that came off the assembly line. And it's a Canadian airplane, which makes it even more rare. Last year, Buffalo sold two CL215s to the Turkish government at two and a half million dollars each. Back to Turkey. Oh, now, the Turks want to add to their fleet, but less than 80 CL215s still exist, and very few are on the market. So that started Mikey on a treasure hunt that has so far only yielded one old photograph. This is right here, uh, what I've been searching for, is the only missing 215 in the world. The serial number 1061. The one unaccounted for aircraft of the 125 that were made back in the 60s and 70s has become Mikey's obsession. When I asked people in the industry about it and they told me it's crashed, it's gone, don't even look for it. And then I was thinking, well, why shouldn't I look for it? So I did a bunch of research and this one, there's no crash record and there's no pictures or nothing. And it's weird because if you think of the internet, there's pictures of everything. Why is there no pictures of this airplane? A, it's crashed, like everyone told me, or B, it's really well hidden. I got a tip uh, from a buddy of mine that works with these aircraft, and he says, no, it's in Venezuela. And that's all he told me. It's kind of like, uh, like a murder scene. You got 10,000 pieces of evidence, but only one or two are valid. One key clue was the water bomber's call letters, INC1. I randomly put it in, turned out to be this airplane, which referenced this picture. And this is the first picture I got to see of it. An outdated picture of a phantom plane. But Mikey needed more proof that the missing water bomber still exists. So we scoured satellite images of the planet looking for the plane. And then... This is a military air base in Venezuela. Lo and behold, there it is. I used the measuring function, measured the wingtips, it was perfectly to what the manual says. It's an open air hangar in a military air force base. It explains why there's no pictures of it. If this 215 is what I think it is, it constitutes millions of dollars in the Buffalo's bank account. But only if the plane is fit to restore. To find out, Mikey needs to go to Venezuela. I sent him this random email saying, hi, my name's Mikey, I'm in Yellowknife. I see you have serial number 1061. Can I have it? And he also needs his father's approval first. We don't know what their government's like. Is it stable? Is it in a coup? Is it in a dictatorship? Is it an overthrow right now? You know, there's, there's a lot of political problems here. But doesn't it sound fun? It sounds like fun, yeah. And it's something you can do, but you just can't. You got to realize you're not dealing with your neighbor. You're not dealing with the USA. With, with great risks comes great opportunity. This is the last 215 available. Buffalo Aries has been here for 40 years because we are willing to do things that are off the grid. Yeah, 215 in marginally good condition. What do you think the margins are uh, if we spend 250 to bring it home complete? Well, you know, on, on something like that, that's pretty risky. You need a margin of 50%. 25% if you don't have a lot of risk. Okay? But if you have a lot of risk financially, the margin's got to go up, so you got to double your money on it. 
This whole idea of saving the airplane is very up a dad's alley. No, it's only original once. Put it together once. You cut it up, you ain't gonna ever put it back together. Once you put the torch to it, she ceases to be an airplane. She just becomes parts. So obviously our preference is to fly at home? Oh yeah, the preference is always to fly at home. That's what, what the airplanes are designed to do, fly not come home in a box. It's a good challenge and everybody needs a challenge. Eh? He found it good. He found something we can use. Rolled out in 1969, the CL215 is powered by dual 2100 horsepower engines. The plane's high wing position and 90 foot span give it stability at low speeds and in the gusty conditions found over forest fires. The 215's unique design allows it to fill its 5,400 liter reservoirs through two small openings by skimming along the water's surface. Then, over fires, it dumps the water through the belly doors on the underside of the hull. With a green light from Joe, Mikey's itching to assemble his team to locate and eventually restore the mystery water bomber in Venezuela. This mission is like treasure hunting. You heard a rumor that there's a sunken ship, and you just happen to be maybe the only guy in town with a boat. And you gotta find a guy that can scuba dive, and you kinda get a little bit of a team together, and you see if there's any treasure. And we gotta do it as soon as possible, get it out of there, because any given time, anything can happen. This airplane may not be available tomorrow. He meets with his older brother, Rod, Buffalo's director of maintenance and ace water bomber mechanic, Corey Dodd. I went to the uh, foreign affairs website and printed out the travel report for Venezuela. Violence against foreigners can occur in all regions in Venezuela, both urban and rural. So not, not really a place you really want to go, is it? Well, all those things are scary. It's like talking to a lawyer, right? Everything is doom and gloom when you talk to a lawyer. Mikey will be bringing Corey with him to Venezuela to inspect the 215. Corey's going to use his knowledge of working on these airplanes for the last 10 years and seeing if we can actually fly this thing home. With less than 80 of the original 125 CL215 still in service, the chance to salvage one that everybody else has forgotten about could be a huge score for Buffalo. But we're going to literally go down there with a bunch of screwdrivers and wrenches, take some key panels off, and see what kind of shape it is. Do not show signs of affluence or display valuables, so you shouldn't have any problem there. <laughs> In 24 hours, Mikey's quest will really begin. Yeah. In the meantime, it's business as usual at Buffalo. On the tarmac, a DC-3 is being prepped for the evening sketch daily scheduled passenger flight to Hay River. Make them shine. Graham Ferguson and Andrew Vike recently passed their proficiency test to become DC-3 co-pilots. Yeah, I'm up here to learn how to fly and to be the best pilot I can be. So. But reaching that goal requires dedication and determination. The test may be behind them, but they need to continue moving forward building their knowledge of these old warbirds. There are some days where I go home and I'm only able to study 15 minutes before I, I fall asleep. The other day I fell asleep and I had the flight manual right on my chest. I woke up ready to go to work at 5 a.m. the next day. Because the next step in their development is flying with the boss, Buffalo Joe. All right, and you too, because I heard you guys slam that door before. Okay, we'll never do it again. Yeah, okay. And Joe we'll expects there. everything from his young co-pilots. This part of the world, uh, so, uh, you can't be timid, you know, you've got to be aggressive. They'll get good at it because their career depends on it and their life depends on it. For the past three years, Joe's had the same co-pilots on the sked. Now he has to break in these two rookies. What happened is we've got some senior co-pilots that are moving on, and we got the junior co-pilots coming in. Don't slam that door. Prior to their checkout flights, Andrew and Graham completed the required 10 hours of training in the DC-3. That's all. As junior first officers, we have very low hours. It is one of the harder aircrafts to fly, and Joe is going to want us to be perfect off the bat. Well, hey, sit down there and see if she's clear out there. The 
go. Andrew and Graham may be hot shots in a certain area, but when they uh, jump in DC3 with the boss, do the regular sked route, these boys better be ready. This is it, a 50 minute flight with 22 passengers on board. Andrew's chance to impress Joe, a man who demands perfection. Airways daily passenger flight to Hay River cuts through the sky. 24-year-old rookie co-pilot Andrew Vike is flying with the boss, Buffalo Joe McBrien, for the very first time. Yes. Uh, can we switch to the other screen show this ETA, Joe? Well, you know what time it is. You know how far back you're going. Definitely a lot more nerve-wracking when we're here with Joe just because you don't want to make a mistake. It's the nerves. It's the fact that you want to do everything uh, to a T. They shouldn't be intimidated or scared. You know, we got to instill in them the airmanship we expect of them. You got to know when you're making your turn how long it's going to take you and where you're going to go to with it. You don't want to allow them any bad habits at this time that will show up later in their flying career. You got to grab the picture at 2,500 feet. How many miles up? How many minutes from now? Okay, that'll be. No, don't tell me because you're going to make a mistake. You're working out in your head and keep working it every day. Joe's methods can be unsettling for a rookie. My mind's set on flying the aircraft well, and he's kind of there distracting me with these other questions, and it really frazzles you, and it makes it hard. If my father can rattle you, you are not ready. If he can rattle you, what happens if you have a real problem in the air? If you have an emergency in an airplane, you're by yourself. You gotta know everything is and how it works. All that stuff you gotta learn, you better know it. You can go to your book and find it. I'll take control here. You have control. I'm trying not to disappoint him. I'm trying to fly as best as I can, and you uh, just don't want to upset Joe. You want to make him happy. And nothing makes Joe happier than flying a DC-3. Now you think you're talking a nice flight airplane. I have a clay wing, have nice thick air. This airplane's going to float. Nice and clean. Nice and light. That's what you think when you left. Handling the DC-3 is second nature to Joe. And he wants Andrew to get to that point soon as well. He has to learn uh, the care and control of the airplane. He has to learn the airmanship. He has to learn procedures. He has to learn to fly the airplane. There's a lot to learn to go from a flying school with a small trainer to a big ass tail dragger in the middle of the winter and dark. Tomorrow I want him to know three things he didn't know today. Three things. He needs three things. Because there's, there's a thousand things, so if he does three a day to start with, that's very good. <laughs> It's 32 below here, eh? Woo -hoo. Oh, cauliflower all over the place. What happened there? Inexperienced. It's departure day for Mikey. He's headed to Venezuela in search of a rare airplane that was thought to be lost forever. But instead of packing, he's become a rampy this morning, dealing with an unexpected flurry of business. If you plan to leave, it's gonna be the day you shouldn't leave, and that's how it is. There's, every day is emergency at Buffalo. Every day there's a problem needing to be solved, so we are just uh, trying to solve problems one at a time. As of tomorrow, Mikey won't be around to problem solve. Oh, oh, t tell him to take it easy with that f***ing cauliflower. Buffalo's been doing it for 40 years, a lot longer than I've been alive, so they can handle it without me. Or can they? <laughs> Later, Mikey sneaks away from Buffalo. Hey, find some stuff. He'll be trading the bitter cold of Yellowknife for the sweltering heat of the Venezuelan jungle. I need something a little bit more breezy. And he doesn't have a thing to wear. <laughs> That's it, that's the, that's the Hawaiian search section right here. We kind of want to look stylish and not so uh, out of place. 
So this one right here, I wouldn't even need to have my Canadian passport ready. <laughs> this ensemble right here would be, please kidnap me. Well, Mikey purchases his new ensemble. Thanks. Have a good day. Corey Dodd is focused on footwear. Can't go anywhere without these things. I spend more time in these sandals than I do in winter boots. That's the key to the whole operation is sandals. Corey never thought that being a Buffalo water bomber mechanic would involve so much travel. Never really expected it. Like, not as far as going out of Canada is concerned, like South America and Europe and overseas. You know, it's been a little more than what I really signed up for, but I like it. It's good. But this mission to locate and evaluate a missing CL-215 presents some definite challenges. At this point, we haven't had any uh, pictures of it or anything. We're going to, we're really going in blind. But the tickets are booked, so we're going. Shorts. Rookie co-pilot Graham Ferguson knows that he's in the same boat as his buddy Andrew. This is what I want to do. I know this is what I want to do. So you just, you take it as a come, you try your hardest, because like, stressing about it's just going to make it worse. They still have a long way to go as far as Joe's concerned. There's a lot of shit to do in your day here. You need to get it all done, and you need to get it done to the satisfaction of Joe. What does Carby give you for manifold pressure? Uh, and so far, Joe's not satisfied with their knowledge of the DC-3. What 600 horsepower coming over to today at 4,000 feet at 30 below? He wants them to know as much about flying the plane as the more experienced co-pilots they'll be replacing. Do you know how to read a power chart? We actually have one in our manual, yes. It's no good in your manual and your manual behind you. If you don't know it, you gotta know that shit. Okay. Andrew and Graham waste no time hitting the books. So there you're at 15. It's lunchtime, but uh, we gotta know this stuff, so. Um, there's no real other time to learn it right now, so Joe's just going to push us until we know everything. It's going to take us a little, bit, a little while to do so, but... Look at there. Yeah. The temperature's pretty much always around 26. Gets to the rookies are determined to show Joe they're ready to fly with him. But can they rise to the challenge? <laughs> Leaving the boys to their studying... Hey, sir. Well, right here, thank you. Joe chauffeurs Mikey and his new summer wardrobe to the airport. I don't know if they're here yet. With only a few days to find and assess the CL215 in Venezuela, Mikey's added another mechanic to the team, Ian Steves. But given the highly competitive world of airplane salvage, Mikey still hasn't told Ian exactly where in Venezuela they're going. Community of 215s, which is the aircraft we're going to go get, is a small community. And one word to the wrong person, you could trip someone else to go get the airplane. Like treasure hunting, you could tell someone you're out going to go look for the Titanic, but you're not going to show them no treasure. Okay, she can get it. Hi, Joe. Sorry. As Corey says goodbye to his wife, Sonia, <laughs> Mikey's girlfriend, Gail, shows up to see him off. The expedition is underway. Mikey, Corey, and Ian are headed halfway around the world, hoping to bag an extremely elusive aircraft. But will Mikey's treasure hunt turn into a wild goose chase? Look at the whitest <laughs> After flying for 12 hours from Yellowknife to Caracas, Venezuela, Mikey and mechanics Corey and Ian are ready to continue their treasure hunt for a prized CL215 water bomber. Are you ready? Let's go. I said, can I come to your country and look at this airplane? I'm from the north and it's really cold. The Venezuelan government said yes. So we're on our way right now to, to Port Ordaz. Yes. Escorted by Luis Padron, Mikey's contact with the Venezuelan military, the Buffalo team will travel 800 kilometers by road to an Air Force base in Port Ordaz. There, they can assess the value of the CL215 Mikey discovered online. Yes, He's prepared to pay up to a quarter million dollars for the plane, 
and could sell it for almost 10 times that price, if it's in good enough shape. After a few hours, a pit stop. And there's still a long way to go. 500 kilometers. 500 kilometers. Holy smokes. That's like an early setting. Yeah, but the biggest thing I get a kick out of is the vehicles here are amazing. They're all mid 80s boats and, and uh, trucks. They're uh, just like being home in Hay River. <laughs> it's a trino. <laughs> Mother Earth. <laughs> Back on the road, they'll soon come face to face with the object of their quest, or so they hope. And it begins. <sighs> Mikey's first day in Venezuela is cargo manager Kelly Jurasevich's first day back in Yellowknife after a much needed vacation. Well, I'll do what I can do and try to get everything figured out, squared away, and taken care of. Her chance to recover from a stress level that was getting critical God, and come back relaxed, refreshed, and better able to deal with the demands of her job. Oh, God. At least that was the theory. Four cases of tobacco missing. How in the shit does that happen? And they want me to find them. Oh, okay. The f how the f am I supposed to do that? Buffalo was probably the most stressful job I think I've ever had. I was happy to see everyone, but still it was just like the stress of it brought it all back to me and you know, what the hell am I doing here? I'm a bit stressed now, as usual, might as well smoke. Stress, chain smoking. Kelly's been putting her life at risk. She's been diagnosed with stage two emphysema and told by her doctor that if she doesn't quit smoking, she could be on an oxygen tank within months. It's like two packs a day here. Like I could easily smoke three packs. Like hands down, easily three packs a day because of the stress level at Buffalo. There has got to be a better life somewhere. Across the road, Joe meets with Chief Pilot Arnie Schrader and Training Captain Justin Simley to discuss the rookie co-pilot's progress. You know, they, I don't know if they come through a college program where they went to a blind school. Andrew went to SFU. They've got an aviation program now. He's got a two-year diploma. Yeah, at least two years. And then the other ones, uh, Grams, went through flying school in Victoria. Regardless of their education, Joe's still not sure they're ready to fly passenger flights. They need a little more practice with simulators. And stuff. The instrument flying techniques are not very good. So Joe orders the boys to spend more time practicing on the flight simulator. So we're going to do another 10 hours in the simulator. You guys stay positive. I know it's, I know it's tough. Once you can do it smoothly, he's going to leave you alone. Yeah. Until you can do that, he's not going to leave you alone. Yeah. Justin's been there. Years ago, he worked hard to become Joe's DC-3 co-pilot. He got a tough job. That's one of the toughest jobs in the company is uh, flying next to the boss. And uh, it's not easy. So I can see it on their faces. Andrew and Graham hope practice makes perfect so they can reach Joe's high standard. Back in Venezuela, Mikey, Corey, and Ian are journeying into uncharted territory in search of an airplane thought to have disappeared years ago. Very excited to see the airplane and and uh, see how it is and see if, uh, if uh, it's, it's, it's feasible to fly away, which is, uh, of course, the main goal. Eight hours of hard driving gets them to an Air Force base in Port Ordaz. I recognize the layout a little bit from uh, Google Earth. DC-3. DC-3s. Yeah. A familiar sight, but not the plane they're looking for. Google Earth was in an open air hangar down there. It doesn't look like it's there anymore. Their guide, Luis, knows what they're after and points it out. When Lewis turned over and said, oh, there's your Mr. 215, and we looked over and like, uh, no, that's a PBY cancel. <laughs> that's a cancel. 
A Canso is an aircraft that looks very similar to a CL215. But a Canso is definitely not the mystery plane that Mikey is on a quest to find. A quest based on outdated satellite photos and some correspondence with the Venezuelan government that was filtered through a language barrier. But it wouldn't surprise me at least if the two of Dean were supposed to come look at was actually canceled. <laughs> it wouldn't shock me. I mean, if there's no airplane, there's nothing we can do. I mean, that's the mis miscommunication or whatever. How in the hell are we going to explain uh, the fact that we travel thousands of miles to get to the wrong airplane? At this point, we actually don't even know if there's a 215 here now. <laughs> we might be chasing the wrong airplane. So I'm, I'm actually kind of nervous right now. We see 215 around here? Because we have Obeys commander. Okay. Here. Hi. This is our call. This is our mic. Here. Like, okay. We are looking the airplane now. Okay. Yeah. 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 Mikey McBrien and his expert mechanics Corey Dodd and Ian Steves flew 7,000 kilometers and drove another 800 to find a long lost CL215 water bomber. Well, I haven't. I've just still seen it yet. It's been elusive this long. What's well, a few more minutes, I guess. But after being shown the wrong plane, they're anxious for proof of the 215's existence. Oh, there she is. I think it's gonna need to paint. It's the CL215 Mikey's been searching for. There it is, Mikey. There she is. But have they found hidden treasure or a pile of scrap metal? The investigation to find out begins. Wow. Now it's up to Corey and Ian to figure out, hey, if this thing's feasible to take home. Pretty complete, eh, Ian? Yes. Yeah. But usually when we encounter airplanes, it's they're usually robbed of all their parts. But this is, uh, it's all here. Have you seen the initial corrosion? Well, it's usually all hidden, right? Oil coolers, I have to change those probably. Yeah. So, Mr. Dodd, the million dollar question. Well, tomorrow I'll give you the million dollar answer. <laughs> and that answer requires a very close look under the hood. I shouldn't be very long, I'll be right back. The next day in Yellowknife, Cargo manager Kelly Jurasevich needs to see her doctor. She's been diagnosed with stage two emphysema and is worried about a recurring lung infection. The doctor said I really have to watch for that and go in like immediately if I notice any change in my lungs because it'll turn into pneumonia. Kelly's doctor has warned her repeatedly about the consequences of her smoking, but that didn't stop her on vacation. Smoking. Holy old crap. It's nothing like going to a country where the cigarettes are two bucks a pack. Got the old lung infection back, so it's antibiotics again. And he asked me how much I was smoking, and I said the usual pack, so he shook his head, and he says, you gotta quit. I actually didn't smoke that bad in Mexico because I really didn't have any stress. But getting healthy might mean quitting more than just cigarettes. I'm gonna try to stick it out for a bit, but I don't wanna end up on the third floor of the hospital here. But for now, it's back to work. <laughs> 7,000 kilometers south, it's time to get down to business. Put my layer in the old tires here, so we can tow it. Crack her up. Determining how badly the plane has deteriorated is Corey's job. The skin of the CL215 water bomber is made up of hundreds of panels held in place by thousands of screws. And the true condition of the plane is hiding behind those panels. Next stop, Yellowknife. 
Oh, right now we're just going to get it in the hangar there so we can get out of the wind for a bit. Pretty exciting, they'll see it move again. Hopefully, everything works out, we'll bring some life back into it. Fly it out of here in a couple months or something. Corey only has two days to do a full assessment of the plane. This will be exciting. Find anything major in this area it could be the could be Mikey's showstopper. So once we open all these panels up, then we will know better. This looks like Indiana Jones Temple of Doom. We're unsealing it after many years. Oh, there we go. She came off. It's yeah. exactly like buying a used car. You gotta pop the hood and check everything out. There's a bunch of dirt on them and stuff, dust, but like, there's no corrosion in there, Mikey. 100 more panels to go, but <laughs> I guess you gotta start somewhere, right? If the 215 structure or systems have eroded, then at best, the plane is nothing more than a pile of parts. There's no real, I don't see any corrosion in there. One thing's for sure. The plane's engines are a complete write-off. These engines are way past due. They've been open for 18 years, birds living in them. The engines could be replaced at a cost of a million dollars if the rest of the plane is in good enough shape to make it worthwhile. Yeah. A few little hydraulic stuff, but I mean, holy crap, they sat for a long time. You gotta expect little, little leaks here and there. This airplane is, is good in some areas, and in some areas it's bad. Uh, but so far the areas that are really bad are just trivial. Uh, I'm kind of scared if Corey opens up a panel and just a big pile of white corrosion, uh, it might not be worth it. Back in Yellowknife, Andrew and Graham are prepping the sked. They've studied hard and spent 10 hours each on the flight simulator. And now, they're getting another chance to fly with the boss. And tonight, the sked has a very special passenger, a Great Dane named Bearpaw. What you got on his leg now? He's got a cast in the cab. Okay, what I'll do is I'll take him out. The enormous dog had a vet appointment in Yellowknife to check how his broken leg is healing. He suffered the injury when hit by a car over Christmas. Look at that. You live along here and it's like you know what you're doing. He's been entrusted to Buffalo for safe transport home to Hay River. An animal lover, Joe is taking a personal interest in bear paw. Yeah, okay. right. To a point. Yeah, walk him around. Take him shit. Okay. All right, dog. Take a shit. Andrew's the flight attendant tonight. So he deals with the needs of the passengers, even the four-legged ones. Poop everywhere. Take a shit, dog. Go poo. Poo, poo, poo. What are you looking for, bud? All right, he wouldn't shit. And we need to board passengers. Graham's got a lot more on his mind than pet sitting. It's his turn as Joe's co-pilot on the 50-minute sked flight. Joe lets dogs fly free on Buffalo sked, but Bear Paw's too big for a kennel, so he's riding up front in the galley right behind the cockpit. Step on the dog. A uh, few things. Uh, please no smoking at all throughout the flight. If you have any electronic devices, please don't use them during taxi takeoff and landing. that all his studying and practice on the simulator has paid off. You're 15 knots low, you're 50 degrees off course, 150 feet high. Now you're 200 feet high. When are you going to settle now? But his nerves are getting the better of him. Now sit back, relax, and you see all this at once. You don't focus on one at a time. Joe's kind of like a grumpy grandpa, I guess. He's only grumpy because he cares. Like, I mean, he wants us to take care of his machine, and he wants us to be damn good pilots, and he doesn't want us to kill ourselves or anybody else. I mean, that's why he's so hard on us, is because he wants us to be the best we can be. But Graham's best might not be enough to make Joe any less grumpy. 
I'll get her over on hitting, leave her on it now so that it, it, speed come up. I don't want to take another 10 minutes because you're trying to burn out a fly all over again. All right. Just as Joe's patience starts to wear thin, a gag-inducing stink fills the plane. Does it smell pretty bad to you? Yeah, it smells pretty bad. Dog just shit everywhere. How many are you got? Simulator upstairs there. Uh, 14. Rookie Graham Ferguson is trying to prove to Buffalo Joe that he's got what it takes to co-pilot the DC-3. Why are your airspeed at 85 knots? Do you want to do it at the head temperature? Can you do that? When the flight encounters a problem. Is it not pretty bad to you? A big, messy, smelly problem. Oh, and that giant gray dane, <laughs> you just, you shit everywhere, man. Oh, dear. Oh. It's kind of funny, Joe just opened a window up and he's like, I gotta get some air out of here, air <laughs> this place out. I don't see Joe smile very often, but look, going into the cockpit, I saw Joe and he was laughing pretty good. He wants the dog shit, he, it put him in a really good mood. <laughs> like, he, he found it hilarious. Poor Andrew is stuck in the back and uh, two cups trying to pick it up and dry heaving and it stunk pretty, pretty wicked. Andrew's flight attendant corps somehow neglected to cover procedures for this kind of onboard emergency. You guys can move to the back if you want to. Yeah, move to the back. It's uh, amazing how one little incident like that completely turned around the mood. I tell you, new experiences every time we take a trip. <laughs> <laughs> In the cockpit, Graham's caught a break thanks to a giant dog's nervous bowel. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, fortunately, we'll be landing soon. So, um, I'll get you out of here as soon as I can. As soon as we're on the ground and the engines have stopped, get out as fast as you can. So, sorry, guys, but it made for an interesting flight. The DC-3 touches down. Not a moment too soon for everyone on board. Another day in Yellowknife. And the freight keeps rolling into Buffalo's cargo terminal. With manager Kelly Jurasevich still fighting a lung infection. I've been taking these stupid antibiotics, and it, they're not kicking in this time. It's just wor getting worse and worse and worse, and I can't breathe at night. As soon as I freaking lay down, I just cough and cough and cough, and like I'm gonna freaking die. <coughs> <coughs> but Kelly's prayers have been answered, <gasps> at least as far as work goes. Jesus. You must have been fortunate, yes. <laughs> Her niece and former assistant, Janelle Glenn, is back. I'm back. I don't know. It feels all right. It's good. Working, so I'm glad. I'm really excited about Janelle coming back because she cares about the position and the job and the customers, and she takes pride in her work. I know that the paperwork's going to be done properly. I know that she's going to make sure that that flight's pulled up properly and nothing's missed because she gives a shit. So it takes a lot of stress off of me having her here. We're going to do it uh, sort of four days on, four days off. Kelly and I will probably alternate shifts or whatever. I think it's just too, you know, it's too much for her. And, you know, six days a week sucks. So we're going to try and do it that way, like alternate Sundays and stuff like that so that we don't have to be here all the time. Want to feel? No. Why? <laughs> I know you do. You're going to. With Janelle sharing the load, the burden on Kelly's shoulders just got a lot lighter. In Venezuela, the water bomber inspection continues. Structurally, it seems like it's intact. All the cables, everything's there. There's not too many things that are busted on it. But now, Corey has to find out if the plane's electronics have survived after sitting dormant for nearly two decades. This could be the deal breaker. Power. See if we can get some action happening. Won't mean it works. There we go, full panel. Be 
beacons on? Oh, he's got beacons. Well, so far, I mean, most of the stuff's working. Seems to be working. Corey's seen enough. Everything we've looked at has been in really good shape. A lot better shape than I anticipated. It's too good of a confused lodge and airplane to strip. So I think we're going to make a go at it. This airplane is amazing. I think me, Corey, and Ian fell in love with it. It's uh, very beautiful, and uh, she deserves to be at work. Mikey has hit the jackpot. With new engines, the plane could be made ready to fly. The plane's done its part. It survived for the last 18 years. Now it's, uh, it's up to us to get the plane home. But that might be easier said than done. There's one crucial detail that could scuttle the whole thing. Who would ever thought a perfectly good 215 is sitting in South America? In Venezuela, Mikey McBride is riding high. The CL215 he found is everything he and his team had hoped for. That's a hero shot right there. All that stands in the way of Mikey returning home a hero is paperwork. We're just trying to see if we can find some paperwork uh, for the 215. The paperwork has been sitting there for 18 years, so hopefully it's around. So this is this is all the records you have? Yes. Like this is it. That's all the on the But that's it, that's, that's it? How do they track all the components? Track the components? Yeah, like all the stuff on the airplane that needs to be changed when it runs out of time. So you have of the avioni on um, the Yeah, no, but there's parts in the airplane that, that are time oh, okay. controlled. I mean after a certain amount of hours and cycles they run out of time. Without records proving when the aircraft was serviced and how many hours each component has been used, the plane would never be allowed to fly. Is, I mean, it's a good logbook, but it doesn't give us a shit. The only way to make the CL215 legal is to rebuild or replace virtually every component on the plane at a prohibitive cost of several million dollars. We have to assume that every part on the airplane is broken and it has to be fixed. Uh, we can't prove it's it's working properly. Yeah. As far as I'm concerned, right now the airplane is not worth yes. nothing. Uh, I tried to to find something. All Mikey can do now is go home and hope the Venezuelans find the missing records, or his quest will have been for nothing. On the next episode of Ice Pilots NWT Operation Airlift. When the ferry linking north to south is grounded, Buffalo mounts a campaign to move vital goods. But can they keep up? Moving day, is it? A Mountie moves house and home Buffalo style. Bye bye, TV. And the McBrien sneak a peek at an important delivery of their own.